My history in uh, rural areas goes back uh, in a research capacity to about 1997. And so our group specialises in very large scale, very long term research, mostly field based. And there are lots of new insights and learnings that are coming from this work including some interesting things even just yesterday with our statistician um, on the importance of plantings and their role as refuges for, for birds during droughts. So what I'm going to do over the next sort of 20 or 30 minutes is just give you some outlines of some of the things that we've been learning in the last uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years and some of the lessons for thinking about um, how we go about replanting revegetation trees and landscapes and why they're really important. And this, this work is actually a prelude to a grant that we won just a couple of weeks ago from the Potter Foundation. Some people might remember the Potter Farm Initiative uh, that was started in the 1980s, which actually gave um, a segue into land care. And the Potter Foundation has now become really interested in this space. And that new work actually has three prongs to it. It has a, an environmental science prong, a finance side, through the College of Business and Economics at ANU and a mental health, a farm and mental health side through the, um, the National Institute for Mental Health Research. So it's really quite an exciting uh, three-tiered uh, research program which we're starting on the 31st of March. Okay, so um, really what I wanted to do was to uh, talk about some of the lessons and a subset of the lessons. I'm going to try not to drone on for an hour and a half but actually give you just a few sort of pointers towards some of the things that we've been finding in the last couple of decades. So our group, as I said before, specialises in large-scale, long-term work. And we have people that are based in Wangaratta, in Albury, in Gundagai, and in Cowra as permanently part of our work. So there's a lot of other staff the, um, the only person who's paid for by the university is actually me. And everyone else is on what we call soft money from, from other kinds of grants, including the New South Wales Environment Trust. So uh, a large amount of my time has been uh, raising funds to keep that exercise going. That's why I've got so much blog here, basically thinking about how we're going to keep things going. So um, we put a lot of emphasis not only on scientific publication and data collection. I know that evidence is, is not a thing that's very fashionable at the moment in a post-truth world, but evidence is actually really important to guide what we're doing. And then we have to go through the process of publishing that information in the scientific literature. And uh, that's quite an exercise. And then we spend a lot of time uh, communicating that work much more broadly because hardly anybody reads the scientific literature. It's really quite a process. What happens is that you collect data for 10 years, it takes you a year to analyse it. It takes you about a year to write it up. You send it to a journal and it gets rejected. You rewrite it, you reanalyse it, you send it to another journal and it gets rejected. Most ecological papers go to three to four journals before they send it back saying this is very good but you have to do a major revision and you go through it again. So it takes two to three years to rework the material and then it gets published and hardly anyone reads it and then you have to rework it in, a, in another form to make it um, politically uh, and um, generally palatable for people to be able to cope with. It's quite a bizarre process and one that takes a lot of effort. So uh, in this process of publishing over a thousand papers in the last 20 years, there's an enormous amount of angst involved in getting every piece of information together uh, to get it through the peer review process. So when I hear politicians say, there's no evidence for something, it makes me cringe, given how much work it takes to collect the data and analyse it, but that's, uh, that's another story. So the, the really important people in this space are some of our field staff. Damien Michael, based in Albury, he's a reptile expert, uh, working here with a pigtail worm lizard. Uh, Mason Crane, who's based at um, Gundagai, and he's specialised in working on the school glide. His PhD has been on that species. Sachiko Okada is originally from Japan, but uh, she's a database specialist and was formerly in Batlo and then Tumut. Dan Florence runs the Environmental Stewardship Program based at uh, Cowra. Uh, and Thea um, Shell is based at Wangaratta 
uh, here she's working on uh, squirrel gliders, but also brush-tailed fastigators. So the, the, the group specialises in collecting large-scale long-term data sets. And uh, I've also been doing this kind of thing for quite some time. Here I am disguised, disguised as a much younger man, <laughs> measuring trees. And um, my history in this space goes back a long way. Um, here's yours truly again with, um, some people might recognise, certainly won't recognise Fran Bailey, but this is Robert Hill. And um, I put this slide up because at the time that I was talking to Robert Hill, his minders were standing uh, sort of across here to one side, and they were telling me unequivocally that everything was known about how to put trees in the ground. <laughs> everything was known about natural regeneration, and the scientists just had to get out of that effing way and just let people plant trees. And I was reminded by the famous um, philosopher, Brandolini, <laughs> In this, in this space, Brandolini's law, the bullshit asymmetry principle as it relates to planting trees and natural regeneration. Now think about how much we've learned in the last 20 years. And Brandolini's principle, um, I won't, don't need to read it to you there, but it's really, um, let's go back, sorry about that. Um, let's go back to that. It's an, a colossal amount of work from that one statement that we've already known exactly what we have to do for the next 20 years to actually rectify that situation. So, um, to me it's really quite extraordinary all the new things that we continue to learn and it makes this a very exciting space. But it also makes it really exciting to see how many people are heavily engaged in this process. And that's the same wherever we've been working, be it in Forbes or in Cowra uh, or Gundagai or Gundawindi. So, our work in the woodlands, the temperate woodlands belt, basically extends from northeast Victoria uh, right up to southeast Queensland, and it is, encompasses a huge number of sites. Um, and I wanted to give this background so that people had a sense of just how much data and how much work goes into this. So that when people say, "Well, why should a tree planting be certain numbers of trees? Why?" we can say, "Because we've been measuring uh, well over a hundred tree plantings for well over two decades to understand what's going on." So that's the extent of the work. So nearly 800 sites, uh, over 250 farms. This is what we define as a landscape for this work, over 50 landscapes. And essentially, it, it expands through the Environmental Stewardship Program from Gundagai to South East Queensland, but we have other studies that the Western Murray, northeast of Victoria. And in each case, we, re we measure a whole series of things. So this is part of our um, long-term, some of our long-term sites. These are permanent sites that are reported on the ground. We measure remnant vegetation. We remember, measure replanted vegetation. We measure regrowth, which is actually very important. We'll get to that in a moment. And we look at a whole series of different groups. We look at possums and gliders. We look at birds. We look at reptiles. Uh, we measure the vegetation, and in some cases we've also been doing work on the invertebrates. And not only uh, things like beetles, but other things like loosened fleas and, and red lurking mites and things like that. So it's quite a, a diverse range of groups, and the reason that we do that is that some people say that birds are really good indicators. And that's true, birds are really good indicators of birds. They're actually not very good indicators of what reptiles do, and they tell you very little about what possums and gliders do. So to get a holistic picture of what's really happening, you need to understand what some of these different groups are doing. And that gives you a better understanding of, of really what's going on in the systems. And so our work also looks at, at things at different scales. So we uh, look at what's happening with individual paddock trees. For example, we know that fire is a really important process in paddock trees. It takes a lot of paddock trees out and signal uh, single events, up to 25% of paddock trees in some landscapes will be lost with a big fire event. We look at plantings, we look at regrowth, we look at rocky outcrops. Management of rocky outcrops is really important. We have a book uh, coming out on that later this year. Almost all of the reptile biodiversity on farms is tied up in those very small places, which are incredibly species rich. And uh, yes, there are occasional eastern brown snakes, but the vast majority of other things are not uh, eastern brown snakes and they don't kill them. Uh, we look at things at the farm level. 
And we also look at things at the landscape level. And later in this talk, we understand, we get to understand why these things at these different scales become really quite important. Now, the other thing that's really critical here is that we've been measuring these things repeatedly for many, many years. And so that tells us about how things are changing from time. And that's also a really important part of it, our story. So there are lots and lots of insights from this. And um, I'm only going to give a few of those insights because um, I know that you don't want to hear me drone on for too long. So the first one is that um, plantings and patches of remnant vegetation actually interact on a farm. So most people put in a planting and then researchers will come and they'll study that planting and they'll study it in, in isolation, just at that planting, or they'll study just a patch of remnant bush. And what we've started to, to discover is that the two actually interact, and they're more than some of their parts. So some things actually need both planted vegetation, regrowth vegetation, or remnant vegetation. So there's a combined value of these kinds of, of vegetation on the farm. And one of my PhD students, Ross Cunningham, has just graduated uh, at the wonderful age of 70. And he, he comes from um, uh, Walla Walla, close to Albury, and he's passionate about this. When he was a young kid, his father said to him if he was doing something wrong, get an axe and get outside and cut down a tree. And now, 70 years later, 60 years later, he said it's amazing how much the landscape has changed and so one of the things that he wanted to do, he's a statistician, not an ecologist, was to actually pull together his statistical insights into some of his work. It's a, it's a wonderful story. And I've been encouraging Ross now that he's finished his PhD to apply for a, a Discovery Early Career Researcher Scholarship <laughs> at the age of 70. Um, it's a wonderful story because Ross was actually my PhD supervisor in um, 1987 in a galaxy far, far away a long, long time ago. So what we actually see is, and, and this is a, a picture from Ladysmith, um, planted areas and areas of remnant vegetation actually combine to give you much higher bird species richness on a farm than you would have if you only had uh, old growth woodland or only had plantings. So this is really quite important for many reasons. Um, through this joint effect of the two kinds of, of bush on a farm, now, the important thing is that many species of threatened birds actually relate to these different features. And when we dig into this further, we discover that little patches of native grassland, patches of bush, replanted areas, regrowth, form what we call part of a portfolio of vegetation assets on the farm. And those different assets are really quite important. It's a little bit like a share portfolio, managing risk. So the, the, the various Vegetation assets are really important to think of in, in that perspective. Now, this becomes really important when people start to talk about offsets. So, some people decide that what they're going to do is they're going to, um, and this is largely coming from pinstripe suit um, lobbyists in Canberra, saying, well, we're going to push over this area over here, but it'll be fine because we'll plant something over there. And the reality is that they're not interchangeable. They're actually different kinds of assets that contribute in different ways, and it's important to think of them like that. So this comes to the second lesson, and that is that um, remnant vegetation, and we've got iron bark here, and then replanted vegetation are different assets, and it's not necessarily that straightforward to interchange them. So we need to dig into that a little bit more, and as part of our long-term work, We've classified our different kinds of study sites, remember there's nearly 800 of these, into different kinds of vegetation. So we know that we've got white box or yellow box or red box or red iron bark or what have you. But we can also look at them in terms of whether they're natural regrowth or coppice regrowth, plantings and old growth. And when you have very large data sets like this, it's possible to com compare and contrast them in very, very uh, strong ways. And what we see is that the different growth forms are different habitats for different animals. And this is true not only if you're a reptile, but also a possum or glider, and particularly birds. Um, now, I'm happy to leave this um, PowerPoint with people if, if that was useful. 
I'm also happy to, to create a printout of it and send it to you if that was useful for people. So what we discover is that different species of birds are re relating very differently to these different kinds of environments. And you can split up the bird community. You can see that this is an extremely, extremely species-rich bird community. This is 90 species for which we have enough data to do the analysis. Uh, so it's about, uh, let me see, it's five times more species-rich than what you would see in most parts of Europe or most parts of northern North America. That doesn't include about another 120 species in the system which receive regularly but not enough to do statistical analysis. So that in itself is a really exciting result. These places are still extremely species rich. And that's a really important message that we often have to give to people living in cities, that these areas are really important for biodiversity and there are ways to manage that. So we see different species in different environments on a farm. And we see that some of these uh, threatened or uh, endangered birds of conservation concern actually turn up more frequently in some kinds of regrowth than others. So, for example, um, this bird is the black chin honey eater. It's not been doing very well over the last 20 years, but it's, it's mostly strongly associated with this kind of regrowth. Then we have an interesting situation, almost diametrically opposed to what we see in forests where we have other work, but that's another story. And that is that old, we have particular old growth species. And most of these are actually very widespread and very common and not of conservation concern. And then we have um, other species that are primarily in plantings. But the key lesson here is that regrowth, old growth, plantings are not interchangeable kinds of places. They're actually quite different habitats. And one of the questions that we don't know the answer to at this stage is whether Planted areas, like the one that we can see on Burnback Farm near Ladysmith, we don't know whether the bird assemblages are actually on the trajectory towards regrowth or they're on a completely different path. It might sound like a bit of a trivial question, but whether or not in another 20 years time we're going to approach what we might see in a natural patch of bush, we actually don't know, which is um, quite, quite an interesting situation. The third thing is that how you do your planting actually matters. So the attributes or the characteristics of the planting are really quite important. And this might seem trivial, but when you dig into the literature, the scientific literature, it's amazing how little is actually written on this kind of stuff. So how, sh how big should a planting be? Where should it be located? What should it compri be comprised of? That kind of stuff. It's, it's frightening how little of that information is, is there. And I think about this regularly when I think back to my time talking to Robert Hill and his mind is telling us that there was nothing new under the sun. What we discover is that um, many species of woodland birds, particularly ones of conservation concern, actually turn out to be most frequently recorded in these planted areas as opposed to being in the old growth woodlands which is really quite a shock. It's not what you'd expect. The other thing that, that we've discovered as of yesterday is that during really hot, dry spells, the small woodland birds of conservation concern are actually using these areas as small refuges, <coughs> which is indicating why they're part of that vegetation asset portfolio on the farm. Now the other thing that, that turns out is that some people will worry that when you put in a planting, what's going to happen is that um, many of these beautiful birds, red cap robins and speckled warblers, flame robins, they're going to be what we call ecologically trapped. And that is that they're going to go into these places, but then they're going to get knocked over by predators and life's going to be miserable. One of our wonderful PhD students, Donna Belder, is actually discovering that these places are highly productive Small bush birds are actually doing really well and breeding highly successfully year after year after year. In fact, more successfully than they are in other places. So these are actually what we call population sources to create other birds to move out into the rest of the landscape. So that's a positive story um, and hopefully that will be something that Donna will publish later this year. Attributes of good planting. What we, we know is that, uh, yes, by and large, larger plantings are better than small ones. But what's actually more important is what's the context for the planting? 
So are there other plantings around or are there other patches of remnant bush around? And so this then uh, reinforces that idea that um, it's the combined value of plantings and remnants that we talked about first in lesson one that become really important. So the area is important, but it's not as important as the context. Um, that's that's a, an important finding. The configuration, yes, as I said before, size matters, but it actually context is more important. The shape also matters. Uh, by and large, block plantings tend to do better than strip plantings. And we've discovered why that is. And the reason for that is that these narrow plantings are places where we get lots of noisy miners. And noisy miners basically beat up everybody else. And the way to sort that out is to leave the plantings in the ground for a long period of time. We'll come to that in a moment. And if possible, when it's the time to, to redo your fencing, is to actually bring out the, the width of the planting slightly to reduce that effect. Now this is really important, again, because of the bullshit asymmetry principle, and that is that there are ways of doing plantings that can make things worse for some things. And attracting noisy miners into, the, into these ecosystems is not, uh, not a good outcome. And we have another PhD student, Richard Beggs, who's working, uh, working on noisy miners and uh, looking at uh, the lead therapy solution to noisy miner problems, um, inserting a small piece of uh, lead shot into a bird from some distance away. <laughs> and what Richard has discovered is that it basically makes no difference. Essentially, we have what's called a vacuum effect, where we have birds that are brought in quite quickly once the, the territories are vacated. And so a much better way to solve that problem is to get at the root of the problem, which is the kind of habitats that we create through the way that we do our plantings and, and the like. So um, that's an interesting story. And Richard's still working on that. He's quite an extraordinary PhD student. He's a pacifist. So somebody else had to do the shooting. He's a vegetarian. I shouldn't say that in a room with people like this. Um, and, he's, and he's incredibly challenged by this whole process. So he wanted to see what the, the outcome of the culling was. And we have shot well over 1,500 birds from uh, many sites in a replicated and controlled experiment. And almost without exception, across the sites it's made no difference. So it's not the, not the solution. Um, the content is very important for your planting. So size, shape, where it's located in the landscape. Um, mistletoe turns out to be really important, which is interesting and particularly important during drought periods. So it's an attribute of the planting that seems to support uh, birds during um, difficult times. Woody debris tends also to be very important, and so many of the landowners that we work with the, the, uh, doing intensive cropping in some of their paddocks will actually tow some of that timber across into the plantings and, and let it there. Uh, at the same time, they also need to do other work in their plantings they need to do um, fox baiting and, and rabbit control and those kinds of things as well. That sort of goes with the territory. The composition of the, the plantings is also important. Acacia wattles tends to be uh, really, really important. And we've discovered some interesting outcomes there. And that is that the more acacia, the more wattle that you have in the understory of your planting, the less likely you are to get noisy miners. So, what we have here on this axis is the probability of detection of the noisy miner and increasing amounts of wattle in the understory. So the more wattle you have, the less noisy miners you tend to get. And when you understand the biology of that bird, it needs line of sight. It needs to be able to see the thing that it wants to go and beat up. And if you put the wattle in, in the understory, the bird can't see it. It's not a place it wants to be. Um, it probably feels threatened and it's not a place that it wants to hang out. So that's, that's a bit of the story of the, the composition. Okay, now, now we're starting to look at a time issue. How do these plantings change over time? And I, I realise that I've got um, very much of a bird perspective on this. Um, I could do a reptile story, or I could do a, a, a possum and glider story, but we'll stick with the birds. Um, and we'll look at what happens with these plantings over time. So we've followed many of these sites for well over two decades now. And many of our landowners say, well, what's happening? 
What's changing? Is it getting better? So part of ecological theory would say that the older the planting gets, the more species it should have. Uh, and you know, there's a species accumulation hypothesis. And this is how often you have to write out your scientific papers with some obscure hypothesis at the start and then fill it in. And really what you want to know is did it change over time and stuff like that. And so that's what we've done. How long does it take for a plant to be colonised by different species of birds or reptiles? Um, how does the assemblage of birds or of the community change over time? And are there patterns of reassembly? So if I get noisy miners, do I also get grey butcher birds? If I get grey butcher birds, do I get black tuna honey? Is that, that kind of thing? And the results are um, kind of sobering in a sense. Yes, birds colonise some of these plantings, which is great, but some species drop out, so there's this replacement going on. But as the plantings get older, we tend to get more of the migrants starting to come into the system, and maybe it takes them time in their tracking process to work out where there's suitable habitat. Um, there's also a link between the size and the shape of the plantings, so that as the um, as the plantings get older, they change. So that narrow plantings don't do as well as wide plantings to start with, but over time the narrower plantings catch up. It just takes them longer to get there, which is a bit of a surprise. So um, the overall richness of the number of bird species in a planting almost doesn't change. There's a slight, a slight increase in winter and nothing happens in spring. But as I said before, the composition changes quite dramatically. So we can look at that um, with some of these crude <coughs> pictures. Here's spring. There's basically no effect for species richness. Winter, there's a very slow uh, and gradual change as the number of years goes up over here. And you can see we've been doing this for quite a while now. Coming up to our 25th year of doing this stuff. Uh, and then we can look at some things that do better over time. Red bottle birds do better, probably because there's more flowering. Um, mostly trees do more flowering as they get older. It's called the Charlie Chaplin principle, and that is that mm. as a tree, you get older, the longer that you live, the more resources you put into growing flowers, to producing more seeds, those kinds of things. Uh, it's, trees have a different kind of life cycle compared to us. Um, other things do worse over time. And so insect feeders like striated pardalotes do worse um, over time, probably because as these plantings start to sell thin, you have fewer insects, lower insect populations, some of these insectivorous species don't tend to do quite as well. Okay, so one of the implications is that there are differences between old plantings and young plantings. And if you're going to tackle this idea of wanting to have um, the range of bird species on a farm or in a landscape, then you might want to have plantings of different ages on your farm or in your farm landscapes or farmscapes. So plantings are good, definitely very good, particularly for some birds of conservation concern. It's where they're most, most likely to be and where they're most likely to breed successfully. But there are differences between old and young plantings and there are ways to, to think about um, that juxtaposition of different kinds of, of vegetation on the farm. Okay, interventions are effective. So one of the most remarkable things in government is that they roll out very large amounts of money in very large programs and then they never monitor them to work out whether they're effective or not. It's really quite extraordinary. And um, I'm having some very vexed discussions with the federal government at the moment who are about to crash and burn a monitoring program for one of the only demonstrably successful environmental programs that we have. Um, yeah, I rest their case. But we can tell with good monitoring whether monitoring, uh, whether interventions have been successful. So. The sad case is that when we sold the telephone company as part of the Natural Heritage Trust, there was almost no monitoring done, so we couldn't tell what we were getting for that investment. So quite seriously. When we had the National Salinity Action Plan, we couldn't tell whether that was successful or not because we didn't monitor it properly. 
And I could stand here and list literally dozens of those kinds of projects. And I, I actually think that it's ethically bankrupt to do that. You actually need to give people some feedback about what works and what didn't and how you would change it and those kinds of things. I arrest the government's case. But one of the projects that they did monitor <laughs> was what we call the Environmental Stewardship Program. Now this was where there were contracts entered into between the federal government and private <laughs> landowners to do conservation works on private land. And this is something that's quite unusual in an Australian context. I actually am a strong supporter of it because if private landowners are going to do public good work on their land, I think there is a place for some recompense for doing that. In North America and in Europe, they spend literally billions of dollars every year or billions of euros every year on these kinds of programs. The problem is in Europe and North America, they don't monitor it. So they can't tell you what they've got for that massive investment. So in the case of the Environmental Stewardship Program, we actually set up a monitoring program right at the start to see whether the interventions would work. Did fencing change things? Did weed control change things? Did the reduction in grazing pressure or change in the grazing regimes, did it have an effect? Did the prevention of bushwalk removal or the, the limiting of firewood collection, did it have an effect? So we set, in a, set up a monitoring program to work out what was actually happening. And uh, this is the Environmental Stewardship Program in yellow here. It's a massive study. It's the biggest monitoring project we've ever undertaken. Uh, and we've been doing big monitoring projects for a long time, since I was 23, which is just one or two years ago. Um, but this one is our biggest one. It's 158 farms, 268 sites. Um, uh, sorry, 368 sites, it's massive. And it goes from uh, southern New South Wales all the way up to here. And it was a demand of the federal government that we visit every farm every year and talk to every landowner and provide feedback to every landowner about what we're doing. So uh, a, a huge project, 158 farms. What happens is that there's an investment made in a woodland patch, a stewardship patch, and the only way to understand whether the woodland patch is doing better or worse is to have a matched control on the same farm to tell us whether the stewardship side is doing better than the control. Because if it rains, everything gets better. If there's a drought, everything gets worse. What you're looking for is the interaction of the two so that when it rains, does a stewardship site get better than a control site? And when there's a drought, does a stewardship site get less worse than the control? And the answer is, by monitoring over the last eight years, the answer is definitely yes, unequivocally yes. So we, we need to measure these different things. We measure birds because people like birds. We measure reptiles because reptiles change very quickly. So we can have a very early <coughs> indicator of what's going on. Uh, we measure these other things as bycatch, uh, and in some places we look at beetles, soil, carbon, and those kinds of things, and the structure of the vegetation. And then we published a little paper on it to make people in Canberra happy about what we've done to say that they're good boys and girls and that it's a good thing to invest in, and they cut our budget in half, and we managed to solve the problem with um, some sophisticated rotating uh, sampling approaches to, um, to statistics. And um, the problem is that maybe the federal government will cut the budget in half again and it won't be possible to do it. But um, we'll have to fight that in some way. But essentially, um, we turn out to have lots of threatened species on stewardship sites. Now this is a really important point. It might sound totally trivial, but the big investments made in, in Europe and North America, the only monitoring they've been able to do suggests that they've been really good at increasing populations of already common species. Great job. We've seen something very different um, through targeted monitoring and the process that they've, went through, they've been through. The stewardship sites do better than the controls, both during drought and during uh, wet periods, and about 5 to 10% of the budget, it's about 7% at the moment, of the total budget for all the contracts. Contracts go to 2027, and there are ways of, of making sure that we do this in a cost-effective way. Um, including a massive cross-subsidy from yours truly to make it happen because I think it's really important to do. 
So some general results, and I'm, I'm not going to labour these for too much, but um, there's one of our stewardship farms close to Barrenjuk. Uh, this is a beautiful place called uh, Riverbend. And what we see here are uh, the um, stewardship sites in blue and the control sites in red. And sapling abundance is doing much better on the stewardship sites, so we're starting to see some natural regeneration, which is really important to replace the next cohorts of paddock trees which are starting to drop out of, out of these woodlands. And um, we see other really important outcomes, more natural regeneration, less bare ground, um, fewer weeds, more native bird species, etc, etc. So it's actually a good news story and it's one of the few that the federal government is able to tell, which is maybe why they're going to cut the program. Um, Anyway, um, yeah. So the next lesson. So I suppose the previous lesson is that interventions do work, and when you actually monitor them, it's like there are things that you learn which can help guide what you're doing. It's it's a, what we call an adaptive monitoring process. So things are changing in these landscapes and quite dramatically, and that's really lesson six. And there are some really important trends. Uh, going on in these systems and um, lots of what we will hear from organisations like Birds Australia is that gosh it's terrible all our woodland birds are declining. In fact when you look deeply at the woodland bird literature and one of our PhD students Laura Rain has done that, there's only seven empirical studies that have actually got data to see whether the, what's declining or what's not. There's 450 papers, but they all sort of somehow just parrot this idea that all woodland birds are declining. The answer is some birds are actually not declining. Yes, there are some that are increasing, there are some that are not changing, and there are some surprises. And so um, we have our little horrendograms here. So yeah, magpies are increasing, so what? Brown tree creeper, bird of conservation concern. Look at that, look at the curve. That bird is doing really quite well. There's another bird here, the, the buff rump thornbill, which is another bird of conservation concern that people are quite uh, worried about. It's actually doing really well when you gather the evidence, even in a post-truth world. That's what we're, we're actually seeing. This wonderful animal is actually increasing dramatically. Very strong increase. And we're not quite sure why, but we have some thoughts that possibly it's associated with covering of grain loads. So when people are moving grain from their farms to the grain, grain terminals, in the past the trucks were open, every time you hit a little bump there was grain that spilled out across onto the road. These things are grain feeders, but they get hit by the next car or the next grain truck coming through. And it matters if you're a long-lived animal, like a parrot, Many parrots live very long periods of time. The key part of the life cycle is adult mortality. It's the same thing with all long lived things. If you're a tree, large old tree, or a whale, or an elephant, or a parrot, adult mortality is a really critical part of the life history stage. Take that adult mortality out of the system, and we've seen it, that's our theory, we've seen these really steep increases. And I, I'm very acutely aware of this. My father is one of those eclectic bird nuts. He only needs to hear a bird fart from 400 metres and he knows what it is. <laughs> He's also a collector of, of birds to put into the wildlife collection in our freezer. When I was a kid, there's always full of dead birds ready to go to the wildlife um, museum and there were always dozens of these guys in the freezer. So, not a, rare, not a common occurrence these days to see, um, see those things squashed on the road, which is a good thing, um, but it's a good news story. So there are some other things that are declining and quite dramatically too. Um, the house sparrow is declining quite significantly. It's a good thing. The common starling is also declining quite dramatically. It's also a good thing. So some birds of conservation concern are declining, um, but many are not. So we've got two examples here. The crested shrike tin is not doing well. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but it might be to do with big trees and large amounts of hanging bark. That's where these birds would be. 
Um, small robins, flame robin, red cat robin, are doing really well and increasing quite well, mostly because they, they really prefer plantings and block plantings in particular. And they're breeding well in those kinds of systems. So they're very important, what we call longitudinal or time series trends, and it's producing evidence of some of these changes. And that's, that's really important to know so that of the 30 species of conservation concern that people are worried about, we can actually now look at five or six that are really in trouble because we've got a good sense that the other 20 or 25 are actually doing okay. Brown tree creeper's doing well. Flame robin's doing very well, etc. Lesson five, don't give up. And I'm getting close to the end of the lesson, so um, sorry to, to, uh, to keep going on. But essentially, this, what we see here is landscapes that are changing really quite dramatically. Um, some of the places that we're working in southern New South Wales, southwest slopes, for example, which is some people regard as one of the most heavily cleared of, of the landscapes in, in New South Wales. Some of those landscapes are now two to four percent more vegetation cover in the last decade alone. And we can see that from satellite work. And we're now working with a statistician who's made some extraordinary discoveries in brain scanning imagery. So what happens is that if you, if you have issues in your brain associated, for example, with, with the development of cancers, what happens is that those cancers change in where they're located and their size and their shape over time. And then the, there are physical characteristics associated with those changes in the brain. And so they're linking the development of these processes in a three-dimensional sense inside the brain with, with uh, some of the, the body characteristics that come with that. Now, what that means is that we can take those statistics and apply it to landscape ecology. That extraordinary. I can't do this sort of stuff, but Alan Welsh from ANU can. And so what we're doing is looking at how these landscapes are changing in the amount of cover and where that cover is over time, and linking that with how populations of birds and reptiles are changing over time. It's called a change versus change process. And Fujitsu has got interested in this because they want to think about this for their biometrics approach to scanning people at airports. So quite, quite a process. So the first thing is that we've seen really quite remarkable changes in the amount of native vegetation cover, be it through plantings or through natural regeneration or both. And you know, that's, this is quite a remarkable process. If you think back to Ross Cunningham and his days of being told to get out there with an axe and cut trees down relative to what we're seeing now, it's really quite extraordinary. So um, we have long-term plots with long-term photographic evidence and also measurements on sites to actually demonstrate the changes going on. The biggest changes are actually taking place in Victoria, uh, northeastern Victoria, but there's very big changes happening here. So uh, big surveys, to, the data for here is up to 2013. We have new surveys in 2014, 2016. We have lots of sites, southern New South Wales, southwest slopes, nested within farms, so the sites are on farms, and the farms are nested within landscapes. And the vegetation cover varies from 4% to 30%. Now the reason that we were asked to do this was that in New South Wales they said, if you have less than 30% vegetation cover in your landscape, it's a train wreck, don't worry about it, don't bother, it's all over. It's what we call a triage process where things are so bad that you don't do anything. We were, we were asked, well, is there any evidence for this? This is the Murray LLS. And so we have the data to be able to look at this. This was a, a, a manager's generated question. So we looked at this. So there should be a critical break point at 30% vegetation cover where everything collapses. And so here's the design to look at this, as I said before. And there's our critical break point. Uh, I can't see where it is because there isn't one. There isn't a threshold of 30%. It's called the law of diminishing returns. And this is the relationship between cover, and yes, you get more species with more cover, but the biggest change takes place down here at low levels of cover. So this is where people such as landing groups and themselves actually can make quite a big difference, a major difference. There are no triage landscapes where it's, it's hopeless. That is not the case at all. The data shows this quite, quite clearly. 
So some people say, no, oh, but what about the rare birds? This is just for all birds. So we have to do the rare birds and we have the same thing. There's no threshold here. Really important again. And again, with the law of diminishing returns, that, that curve, you make quite a substantial difference down at the, the low ends of, of cutoff. So even landscapes that are quite extensively cleared can still have major remedial processes and make a big difference. So the amount of vegetation cover tells you a lot about what's happening with the bird, bird communities. And it occurs at the site level, where you do individual plantings. It occurs at a farm level, where you look at what's happening right across the farm. But it also occurs at a landscape level. So what that means is that if you do something at, at your sites, on your farms, <coughs> there is a carryover effect to your landscape, to your farms, and then to your landscapes. So there's this value that goes up through the, the scale chain, as it were. So your double species <coughs> richness, and the easiest place to do that is actually down at the low levels. Because in some places it would be impossible to get to 30%. And it gives people this sense of hopelessness that they can't do anything because they'll never get to 30%. <coughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. There are things you can do down at this low level and there are no triage landscapes. So this idea, triage comes from hospitals during the war where you had hundreds of troops that had all been shot to pieces. The uh, nurses and doctors would walk around and say, this one, this one, this one can be saved. We don't think that one and that one is going to make it, so we're going to work on the ones that we can save. This is not the outcome here. And we can see that we get some birds that do really well as you increase the cover, and some are very common, but some are birds of conservation concern. And that's what it looks like, just to make sure that there is evidence. And then some do really badly the more cover you drive up. And they're things you don't actually really want in the system, noise and miners and starlings. So the lesson is that Increasing vegetation cover makes a difference, and that what you do at one scale has an effect at another. And so this is part of this change versus change work. And there are clear benefits of planting in the system over the 10 years that we've, we've uh, looked at. So the final lesson is one of partnerships. So the previous lesson, all of that analysis actually came from uh, the Murray LLS and their local landowners asking about what's going on. We had never thought about thresholds, we'd never thought about these changes at these different scales. And so this, this interplay of trying to make sure that the science is management relevant really drives us in, in what we'll do. And so we have field staff and they're part of local communities being Wangaratta or Albury or Cowra or Gundagai. And they have paddock credibility. Several of them are farmers and they speak paddock speak. You know, they don't come from Canberra, they're not overeducated, they don't, uh, they don't have this life in a bubble like I do. These are real people that, that are on, the, on farms every day speaking to people. And they put a lot of time into field days and a lot of time into field work and a lot of time into discussing issues with, with farmers. So, you know, linking together management with monitoring and research becomes really important in this case. And they need to be part of the process together. I think too much research is done for the sake of it without actually thinking about how relevant or otherwise it might be. And there's this really, really important process of dialogue between farms and managers. So as part of the POTA initiative that we've just been funded for, we'll be starting a series of demonstration farms where we will pay for the, um, the, the beers and the biscuits and the sausages and other things and bring people out to talk about their story about how they've tackled particular problems and uh, things that they wanted to do with their farms and what worked and what, what didn't. So it's, it's actually much more tangible rather than abstract. And try to bring our researchers not only our ecological and environmental scientists, but also our finance people. And um, the mental health thing is in a different sphere, but that's a really critical part of this. And really seriously commit to monitoring. 
because I'm quite convinced that there will be a stage in the next five to ten years, hopefully, when we will have gone through the post-evidence, post-truth era and we'll be back to a stage where we actually need evidence to make sensible decisions. Seriously, at the moment, what's actually happening is that people are looking at what's going on on Twitter and Facebook to work out what to do with their policies rather than what's right. So we've put in a lot of effort in this communication space, and each, each year we produce a little, a little calendar. Um, each year I get about 30 or 40 emails saying, why are you wasting public money on this? Um, I pay for this. Uh, I've left a box of them at the, the uh, end of the table there. We've even put, this year, our landowners asked if we'd put a, rain, um, a rainfall thing on the back, so we've done that. And there's little stories about uh, who's doing different things on different farms, why sacred like kingfishers respond in the way they do, that kind of stuff. So you're free to take one of those. There's even a little hook so that you can put it on the nail on the back of the toilet, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's really, um, that's really the story. There's lots of exciting insights. Uh, it's anything but we know everything, but that doesn't mean we don't do anything. There's lots of guidelines for what, we, what can be done, and they do make a difference. And it's actually a really positive and exciting story. Um, and I have to say it's fantastic to see so many people engaged in these kinds of events because it's really, really where it's at and, and it justifies in many ways the, the kind of efforts that uh, have gone on between farmers and land care and, and, and other groups over the last 15 to 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.